Okay, so um, <clears throat> my um, plan was basically, I thought it might be interesting first to talk about the most recent work, um, which is Jack Straw's Castle, um, made this year. Um, and what I wanted to sort of get into with that work is kind of thinking about some of the shifts that have happened in your work, Rosie, where, um, for example, when you first sort of started making films, it feels like they were very much in a kind of, you know, there was, there was sort of a direct relationship to documentary. Um, and you often seem to be kind of performing the role of a kind of, you know, quite sort of anthropological role. There was a sort of, you as a filmmaker going into enclosed communities, you know, for example, a really early film, um, you know, that you made about the Glasgow jumble sale, which I think was called The States of Things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sort of filming the people at the jumble sale, their behavior, you know, it's a very kind of close study of a very specific location, context, group of people, their behaviors. And it sort of feels like um, with your earlier work, you know, you were more in that sort of anthropological mode. I mean, there was also kind of Herash House, I think it was called, mm -hmm. filmed in Palestine, where you sort of, you know, turned your gaze towards, you know, a very specific family. You know, the whole film is inside their house, looking at their kind of behavior within the house, their relations with each other um, over the course of, an, is it a day or is it sort of several days? Like 13 days or something. Yeah, days. yeah. So it's a very sort of tight time period, mm. very kind of close study of them. And with this recent film, um, Jack Straw's Castle, it feels like you're beginning to kind of, I mean, you've been breaking that for a long time, you know, sort of been, I mean, maybe eyeballing um, is, you know, the film that sort of marks a kind of shift in your practice where you're sort of beginning to introduce other material into this kind of more documentary like. Mm -hmm. um, style, but with the sort of recent film, it feels like there's three very kind of distinct things going on, you know, because on one hand there's the very sort of close observation of the gay cruisers on Hampstead Heath, you know, and sort of study, you know, kind of studying, in a way, a study of their behaviour, kind of study of their sort of body language, kind of, you know, observing them through the trees, so it's sort of, you know, you have the kind of documentary mode. But on the other hand, there's this very, very kind of constructed scenario of the film crew, um, and kind of observing the film crew, but it, it definitely has a feeling of being constructed. It's not sort of a film crew that you've stumbled across, that you're just sort of, that you've found. You know, it's, it's obviously a scenario that you've constructed. And it's, in a sense, it's kind of a more formal approach than the sort of documentary mode. And then there's kind of a third thing coming in, which is the images from the painting. There's these mm -hmm. sort of images from, um, I've got it written down somewhere, but... The forest fire. Exactly, yeah. Was it Piero di Cosimo? Cosimo. Yeah, mm -hmm. from the 16th century. So these sort of dreamlike images from the painting, these kind of x-rays. And so what I wanted to ask first was kind of how you see yourself in relation to documentary practices and what is the kind of gap between this sort of documentary mode that you sometimes use and then this kind of much more sort of subjective approach or kind of, um, you know, self also very kind of self-reflexive approach, you know, with mm. the sort of constructed scenarios. I think... Um I always start, or there's always some aspect of my films that are filmed from reality. And now I can already think of examples in this show where there are, aren't any. So um, it's not quite true. There's usually something filmed from reality, but I've always used that sort of real observation as a sort of starting point for talking about another layer of reality, let's say, than the kind of immediately obvious one. So with the earlier films, sort of pre-2004, or up until then, I um, yeah, I was interested in these closed communities, and I was, um, but I wasn't interested in that particular family or that particular place. I was always after a more archetypal sort of rendering situation, and I felt like there was a confusion between what I wanted to do and how the work was read, which was obviously my responsibility. So I decided that I would clearly kind of or be clear about my intentions which meant um, initially getting away from um, private sort of individuals who could be read as having their own backstory and it could be about them, that family, that subject, and therefore there's obviously going to be big gaps because I'm not trying to give a portrait of a family or, or of a place. Um, so with eyeballing, I, went, I then looked at these things that sort of make the crudest representation of the human face. Um, and the sort of dehumanized men in uniform. Um, but 
Yeah, and Jack Straws. It's the se again, this kind of using something real, it seems really important to me, the fact that I did not stage the scenes of the men going around. Um, there's a sort of tension there that is really necessary. And then the crew, I sort of imagined that I would construct that even more than I did in the end, the, the part with the crew. I imagined that I would have them sort of um, almost doing little scenes. I mean, they are doing little scenes, but they're really doing their job. And none of it's scripted, of course. Um, the one very, very constructed scene I had, or one of them actually ended up on the cutting room floor completely. So, I mean, do you think having those two things, in a way, highlights... I mean, because on one hand, with the gay cruisers, you know, um, and one of the things that I'm sort of interested in in your work is, is kind of the performativity within the work and sort of, and you know, the kind of self-reflexivity, you know, because everybody is positioned, especially in the kind of post um, 2004 or five, you know, when you had the sort of transition in your work, everybody is kind of positioned as a performer. You know, it feels like the policemen in eyeballing, they're very much, um, you know, they're very kind of macho, they're very sort of, um, you know, kind of, it's very difficult to see a New York policeman except in relation to the movies. Mm. You know, like, I sort of feel like when I watch it that my only relationship to that role is sort of via the movies and you see them being very kind of macho and mm. sort of, you know, very kind of cool and conscious of themselves in the uniform and they're performing a role, mm. you know, and then kind of the, the gay cruisers are obviously in a sense, you know, performing for each other. Um, and kind of, I wonder if having, you know, with, with the sort of Jack Straw's castle, the fact that you have these kind of two very different ways of constructing the film, which are sort of happening in relation to each other, whether that highlights, you know, on one hand, that the part that is taken from reality is actually, a, to some extent, a performance, and on the other, you know, on the other yeah. hand, sort of yeah. highlights the constructed nature of yeah. the film crew scene, you know, yeah. that that is very much a construction, because yeah. it's obviously not a documentary. Yeah, I mean, it's just sort of many things to say there. Um, there's in relation to the idea of like, I tend to film people performing rather than just being. I mean, I'm quite interested in that line between like just being and performing yourself. And then actually there are very few moments in life where you're truly absorbed in whatever you're doing. I think it's quite often there's some part of you who's sort of observing yourself or being observed, observing yourself being observed or imagining yourself doing what you're doing. So that is definitely a theme, but also, yes, this thing of like the, the ritualized behavior of the cruisers and the sort of performance, which is not kind of very strongly put because um, it's only the context that sort of tells you what's going on really in this sort of tension maybe. Um, really, I think the point there is I get excited somehow of this line between what's real and what's staged and, and what, and that is, seems to be an area where there's a lot of possibilities. I mean, in other films, that's what excites me as well, when you know, there's some sort of um, real situation, then something staged comes into it. I don't know why, it's just kind of there. And then um, this idea of the second half influencing the first half. So in the, the second half is constructed, and then it makes you sort of see perhaps the first half as more constructed. Um, or more performed, let's say. I mean, really, they're just, I suppose, different ways of thinking about desire because the second half is all clearly for you, I think, it's for the viewer. It's set up for your desire. Do you want it like this or do you want it like this? You know, do you like... I mean, there's that scene, the one scene, I think, which really highlights how constructed that second half with the film crew is, is the scene when, um, you know, there's two guys in a piece of orange cloth and then you have your mother coming in who kind of is almost like a stand-in for you. You know, she sort of occupies the role of the artist. Mm. And they're having a conversation with her where she's sort of saying, oh, no, I like it like this. Oh, no, like that. I mm. like this. Yeah. You know, and, it's, and the, you see the sort of construction yeah. going on kind of there and there. You know, that seems like the sort of moment that really yeah. kind of emphasizes how constructed yeah. it is. And because it's such a formal thing, it's very much, you know, it's a, a piece of orange cloth. You know, it's very mm. like the way that you construct a painting, or it's very much about <laughs> the way that you construct an image. You know, kind of do, do you, you know, like the sort of, in, to use the metaphor of painting, like do you put a kind of orange square in the lower left, or do you put it in the upper right? You know, mm. it's the sort of basics of 
art yeah. practice, the basics I mean, it's of, sort of making that, art. That idea of where, yeah, how, how, you, how do you feel satisfied by a sort of aesthetic decision or whatever, like the orange fabric behind the tree is a little bit like, I mean, I'm sort of making a relationship between that and the more sexual sort of practice that's going on in the first half, really. It's like, I like it like this, you know, or I don't like that. So, in a way, it's sort of somewhere between that kind of bodily pleasure and, and aesthetic pleasure sort of being meeting up. Yeah. I mean, in a very basic way, I was thinking it might be... Would you be able to... Because I think it's the most... Re you know, because it is the most recent book work, it might be interesting to sort of hear more about how you have kind of constructed it. Like, in a very mm -hmm. basic sense, how did you sort of begin thinking about the piece? And how did you begin sort of mm. going to Hampstead Heath and decided, you know, how did you decide on that as a site and then filming the gay cruisers okay. and, you know, which came first? Which half of the film came first? Uh, the cruisers came first. That's been going on for about a year, probably, that I've been thinking about that, in fact. Um, so, Lucy Scare and I were doing a collaborative film, um, which ended up, quite different but we part of it we were filming cruises we kind of both brought to this film what we wanted to do and tried to work in a very intuitive film and uh, way sorry and I said that I would quite like to film these cruises in the cemetery near where I live in Stoke Newton and that sort of didn't seem to go anywhere and um, so I sort of kept it on the back burner and um, and then the gravestones were just too much really had to get rid of the gravestones it's like death and sexual so um, Hampstead Heath seemed to be, I mean, actually, the whole pastoral feeling and that, that it lends itself to kind of landscape painting and literature as well, you know, things set in the woods and, you know, that all was part of it. So first of all, there was that. And then it was kind of trying to figure out my relationship to that. I began to think about... Um, I suppose, yeah, the play within a play, which we sort of briefly touched on earlier. Yeah, we were, we talking, were talking earlier about, about Midsummer Night's Dream. Yeah. And that the film maybe has a relationship to, to Midsummer Night's Dream yeah. because it's, you know, it is that sort of space of fantasy that happens in night, at yeah. night time in the woods and sort mm. of, you know, the gap between what happens in the woods in the daytime and the night time and sort of yes. desire. So the film crew would be there kind of almost almost something that you happen upon by chance, but they're actually construct... They're, they've got their whole kind of world going on. So it's another kind of world, really. I don't really know how that happened, how that, you know. But um, so I went out um, on several occasions filming these guys, and then um, we did one all-night shoot with the, with the film crew of about 20, from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., and that was that. We didn't sort of revisit that again. So the one part of the film took several weeks or months, and the other part was just 12 hours in the shoot. Yeah. So again, it's kind of a distinct... It's like two, two very different processes. Yeah. Like, um, I mean, we were talking again earlier about um, the idea of sort of... For the actual sort of, you know, the filming part, the, the bit when you're sort of out filming something almost as part of the research kind of not knowing what it's going to look like until mm. you've kind of filmed it. Mm. And sort of that part being, in some, to some extent, kind of instinctual, and then the rationalisation yeah. happening in the editing, the yeah. sort of way that you organise the images and sort of organise a kind of narrative within that footage. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important to work in a way that you don't know the answers and um, you don't know whether actually... You don't really have any insurance of when it's, whether it's going to work out to be a film worth seeing or actually nothing. And I think that that's always been important for me. So it's... So at the point of the planning and the shoot, I don't ask myself too many questions because I know that it would be false answers that I'd be giving or I'd get lost. So I sort of say, OK, I want this and I want that and then I'll do it. But you set yourself quite tight parameters. Yeah. So you sort of say, you know, I'm yeah. going to you know, get a film crew and put them on Hampstead Heath. Yeah. And that's already a very kind of tight set of parameters. Yes, it's not going out with a camera and just waiting until something happens. It's yeah. totally constructed. But the point is that there's this sort of lack of knowledge rather than knowledge. Mm. So it's like, I know, there's certain things I know. I know that I want to film the film crew. I know that their performativity and their sort of creating of this magical, pleasurable or beautiful or strange environment will be related to 
this kind of mingling of man and nature and, and sex and desire in the cruising part. But um, I don't quite know whether they'll meet or not. And that lack of knowledge is kind of like a sort of um, a, a gap which needs to be film, um, filled. I keep saying film. <laughs> so, it's like to keep saying it. And all. Um, a gap which has to be filled by the work. So the work is basically the investigation. So the camera is a sort of investigative tool. And the other, I mean, the other big topic that sort of comes up, particularly in that film, but also very much, I think, in a lot of your works, is gender. You know, because mm -hmm. there's a, one of the things I'm quite interested in that film is that, you know, the first half, the gay cruises, it's obviously a space of men. You know, it's a world of men desiring other men. And then in the sort of second part, it's, I find it very interesting that, you know, on one hand you have kind of your mother more or less performing you, like she's in the role of the artist, she's the one who's sort of being consulted on where the piece of orange fabric should go or not. Um, but it's kind of interesting that she's an older woman, you know, she's, mm -hmm. she's a sort of 60-something woman, you know, and kind of, and we're not used to seeing women, and particularly women of that age, in that role, you know. Um, and so it kind of says something about kind of, um, you know, gender relations, or it sort of says something about, you know, the space of men, traditional sort of space of men, and what is traditionally associated with being the space of women. Mm. And I think this kind of comes up a lot in, you know, in your films. Like, for example, um, in Bachelor Machines Part One, which is the film on the cruise ship, where you sort of focus on, you know, this totally male environment with this sort of crew um, of 30 sailors, you know, kind of for, you know, over, over a sort of period of, is it 10 days or something? You 13 were with them. days. 13 again. days that you were there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and sort of, um, you know, and in that film, it's again, it's sort of very obviously the space of men, you know, it's sort of exclusively male space. But then some of their behaviours um, kind of, you know, some of what the actions that they kind of perform are sort of actions that we traditionally associate with women, you know, even mm. though they're very kind of macho, they're very masculine, um, sort of quite stereotypically so, um, you know, you see them kind of cleaning up or something, you mm. know, or you see them sort of um, having to adopt these different roles within the ship, you mm. know, which is quite interesting. Um, and so in terms of the sort of, I mean, one thing I wanted to ask was about, um, you know, the women in your films who kind of stand in for you. So, because the other film in which you kind of have a stand in is Footnote, where you have Heike Beiler, um, and she, or Helke Beiler, isn't it? Helke, Sorry, yeah. mixed up her name. Um, and she's sort of, you know, in the bed, kind of reading the magazine, and she's basically re-performing an experience that you've had. Mm. And so again, you've sort of chosen this older woman mm. um, to perform the role of you, you know. And so I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the decision making yeah. behind that. Like because why those I, two women? you were absolutely right, but I hadn't thought about that before. That they, I did particularly in footnote as well, go for an older woman to stand in for me. I think I'm sort of quite interested in, um, um, well, you were around when I was trying to figure out what to do with Jack Straw's Castle, because we share a studio. And um, I was sort of already making this, the idea was to make this film about the gay cruises. And I was thinking about them as a sort of, um, potentially a marginalized group, but then there's the whole fact of being in a group which is not marginalized in a way. It's a sort of acceptance, of course, if you're, you're a part of a community. And I really think of the sort of middle-aged or older woman as the truly sort of marginalized um, figure in society. And so I just thought it would be interesting to bring her into this um, sort of subculture where she absolutely doesn't, because, you know, if, if I don't belong there, is an even further step that she wouldn't belong there. And um, so that felt like a, a more sort of subversive act in a way. And, and similarly with Helka Barla for two reasons. One, because she's an older woman um, as the sort of main focus of the film. And two, because her husband is a um, very um, brilliant, sort of well-known filmmaker and, and teacher. And she sort of helps him in his work. So she's sort of in relationship to him, in relation to him all the time. So it was the private life of Helka Viola seemed like an important, that it would be her private moment in bed reading and her strange experience was the sort of her subversive act in a way. 
So, yeah. That yeah, because it's also a group, I mean, sort of women of that age group are also particularly excluded from the screen. Mm. You know, you don't see them in cinema so much. You know, it's kind of, it's young women that you see in cinema. Yeah. And sort of, you know, and men on the screen, you know, we're, we're kind of used to seeing sort of older and younger men on screen. But that particular kind of group, age group of women, we just don't see on the mm. screen very often, mm. you know. So in some way, it's also a kind of commentary on cinema, I think, mm. which often within your work, you do seem to be commenting on cinema. Mm. Like you have, mm. um, you know, kind of, I mean, sometimes it's a very, very direct reference to specific filmmakers, you know, like, I mean, Chantal Ackerman obviously is referenced in The Captive, you know, because it's a kind of reconstruction of a scene from, a Chantal Ackerman film, you know, or um, Alexander Kluger, you know, is obviously referenced in Bachelor Machines Part Two because again, you have Helker and Thomas Bylow reconstructing a scene from a yeah. Kluger film, you know. So that's a very kind of direct um, reference to cinema and the history of cinema and your influences. But then on the other hand, there's this kind of commentary on on cinema um, and kind of the the role of the artist, you know. As as I sort of said earlier, I sort of think. Um, you know, the kind of, in Jack Straw's Castle, you know, this, this sort of self-reflexivity of this constructed scenario of making the film is very much a commentary on the artistic process itself and kind of the role of the artist within that and mm. your role and your mother as the stand-in for mm. you in that scenario, mm. you know, and how, how film and how art is kind of constructed. Um, but with, I wanted to ask you a bit about um, your relationship with Thomas and Helke Bylo and how that came about and sort of... Yeah. Well, that film, um, it, I was looking to make that film. Uh, I needed to make that film. <laughs> I had a deadline, and I wasn't quite sure. I'd just made Batch of Machines Part 1, although I hadn't titled it yet, obviously. Otherwise, I would have known <laughs> what I was going to do next. I'd just made this film on a cargo ship. I had just shot it, and I'd gone to Oslo to a residency in, in, in this place where I knew nobody and was kind of five weeks of snow and darkness, I was going to edit this film on the cargo ship, but at the same time, I needed to shoot another film. And I was interested in Alexander Kluger, this film that I'd seen called um, Artists Under the Big Top, Perplexed, which is about circus artists. And um, in the film, there's a woman who decides she wants to sort of make a new kind of circus where the animals are treated sort of with respect, but also that she goes through different ideas. Like sometimes she wants them to demonstrate the laws of physics, and other times she wants them not to be sort of acting like humans and different things. But the point is she struggles to sort of get her ideas across, and she meets people and chats to them and tries to take expert advice, and then she buys an elephant, and it's just all these things really appealed to me. And uh, I went, I thought, well, I'll try and find Alexander Kluger because what I wanted to do was to make a film that sort of investigated why I liked that film and tried to understand it better for myself. So there was this one scene in the film uh, where she, the protagonist, is talking to this older guy who's an old, a friend and mentor and sort of um, some strange sexual relationship between the two as well, I think. And they're sitting on the couch together and they're talking and the camera sort of pans between them and then they lo he looks at the camera and and they touch hands at one point. It's all the exact things that Thomas and Helker are doing. And I juxtaposed two scenes in the film, the real and the reenacted. I'll get to answer your question about how I met them. Well, I went to Oslo, and Thomas Byler was doing a residency there as well. And in the meantime, I couldn't get Kluger to meet me because he was traveling and doing book tours. And like uh, Kluger and Thomas Byler are both 70-year-old men from Frankfurt, so there was a definite connection there. And I met him at that time with his wife, and we had this sort of interest in each other's work, and he has a fan fantastic way of talking about things and understanding of things, which comes from a completely different angle than the one you'd expect. I mean, it seems like he puts... he kind of um, puts things, ideas together that you wouldn't sort of expect to put yeah. together. You know, yeah. It's like very sort of um, kind of you know, these sort of associations which are on one hand kind of fantastical, like when you first hear it. You know, for example, in the film when he's talking about the relationship between the machine and the rosary, you know, and saying that sort of, do, you know, mm. doing the rosary is equivalent to the sort of mechanic, you know, mechanistic Invention process. Of the machine. And, mm. and kind of, and you think, what? You know, kind of, it's like this sort of, you know, kind of idea that's quite hard to sort of comprehend initially, but they think, well, it's an, in, you know, really interesting way of looking at I the think, world. And yes, it's things. his, yeah, it's his world view, which yeah. is, 
completely unexpected but somehow logical. It has its internal logic which works um, almost like the machines that he's talking about. So when he, I mean, to get to the story of how that text came into the film, I asked him to reenact the scene. He gave a talk where he made this digression, which is the, the dialogue in the film. And so I, it, I kind of brought all those things together with my own work as a way of looking at them all together and trying to understand them. But what interests me about what he says is whether you agree with it or not, and it's quite far-fetched, um, the way he presents it, the, the form, the way he says it is very close to the content. So he's talking in a very regular rhythmic way about the sound of the rosary and the sound of the machine and what this is leading to. So you can't help but sort of listen and go into what he's saying and, and accept it on some level, however strange it and may I think, seem. I mean, I think there's a kind of parallel to the way that you introduce these quite random images sometimes to the film, you know, like the sort of you know, the relationship between the, you know, the painting in Jack Straw's castle and the two different scenarios that are going on. Or in Footnote, when Helka is reading the book and then suddenly you have this frog and you're like, what is the frog doing there? I mm. have no idea. You know, and it's quite sort of dreamlike. It's like the logic of, mm. of dreams in a sense, mm. that you can put sort of images and symbols in relation to each other that don't necessarily make sense, but they're not making sense becomes productive, Acceptable, sort of imaginatively produ yeah. productive. Or you can, yeah, you can accept them, as you say, acceptable. Yeah. You, can, you can accept these sort of things going together and mm. sort of accept them as part of a constellation of images mm. that don't necessarily have to make sense in a traditional sort of, you know, kind of rational yeah. way, you know. It, and it kind of allows for the space of the irrational to some extent. It's sort I of think that's an that important seriously. Yeah. point, actually. I think that the, the way that I would like to make work is or films is sort of acceptance of you know and I sort of strive to like do that in my work because quite often we sort of censor a lot of things or we question them and that's maybe important but sometimes it's just anti -product productive so yeah acceptance leads then to more knowledge I think and I try to sort of say okay I'm interested in this and interested in this and if I look at them together and if I then work through in the edit what was quite intuitive in the shoot I'll be able to sort of get a bit further for the next film thing. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a big, in your work, there's a kind of big dialogue between the rational and the irrational, you know, in that I know you're very interested in Jung and you've kind of often talked about sort of using, you know, certain images as archetypes, like the, the faces in um, eyeballing as archetypes. Mm. Um, and kind of, you know, and then there's this sort of introduction, sort of introduction of a particular kind of magical or sort of dreamlike reality, like the painting in Jack Straw's castle, you know. But then you never kind of totally enter that space of the irrational. It's always a kind of, you know, sort of pointing to that or sort of using it as a, as a kind of moment of interruption of, mm. of the kind of, of the rational. You well, know. I think it, perhaps with the work that Lucy and I do, we, we go more that way, I don't know, but... Um, I think uh, perhaps, the re I don't know, um, the reason for that or whether that's entirely right or not but I think that um, using reality is an important part of my work because there's something about if you use the real you can talk then about other things so if you're, if you're just using sort of um, abstractions or fantasies or you're sort of constructing a world which maybe there's no reason why anyone else would want to go there sort of Nashashibi world like why would you want to go there but the I find it easier to use um, something real in order to talk about something beyond reality. So it's sort of anchored in a way, but it's going somewhere else. And it's just almost like setting up a filter. It's easier to sort of look at something through something, through a filter, than, than face on. Does yeah. that make sense? I mean, we've also talked a bit about, um, you know, kind of, I mean, one other thing that I'm quite interested in is this you know, is, is the relationship between the corporeal and the, you know, and the um, cerebral. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've talked about it in your, in one of the texts that you've written in the catalogue about the works, you know, and particularly with the, um, with Footnote and Helka Beiler, you know, that's in so, to some extent what the piece is about, yeah. as you've described it to me. Um, you know, kind of Helka Beiler, you know, reading this text, having this cerebral experience and that precipitating a physical experience, which is uh, her kind of looking down and you place the emphasis on, on this sort of, you know, kind of um, 
on this sort of physical experience, this kind of action that she performs. Mm. And again, I think that's a similar kind of binary, you know, between the sort of, you know, the kind of rational kind of and the irrational, all the sort of documentary in the space of fantasy. You know, yeah. you seem to swing between these kind of binaries, and that's where you sort of right. produce meaning. You know. Yeah, I mean, also between the sort of the cruising and the the construction of cinema. I mean, that one is the sort of space of the mind, and one is the space of the body. Whereas, in fact, you can't really. They're both both. You know, you can't really make that distinction. But um, yeah, the the Helka Biola thing might merit some explanation. I mean, she's basically reading in bed, and she gets to a point in the text where she would see little number one for the footnote, and then she looks down. It leads her to the bottom of the page. She reads the footnote, which is the frog, and then she looks back up. And for me, it was an experience of just reading in bed late at night um, while my boyfriend was asleep, and. Um, having this moment of reading this journal, seeing the little one, looking down, looking up, and suddenly feeling like this sense of satisfaction that that, that little um, written code had led me to this physical act, that something cerebral had led to a physical act, which is really simple and really stupid and really not nothing, in a way, somehow led to a sort of feeling of completion that made it seem that time sort of crystallized around me and that everything was... Um, held still and so I thought and I thought is that is it possible perhaps to portray a sort of interior moment where it seems that time stands still that you experience on your own late at night in film visually um, and, the, and it's not really possible I mean I it's, it's, it's possible but only by inserting something yes. to stand in for that it's not possible to see that f interior thing from from yeah. simply looking at her, her head going up and down, yeah. and these changes of colour, which I thought might be yeah. enough. But it's a very so Proustian kind of problem. I mean, it's like it's sort of very much, you know, kind of the way that sort of Proust in Remembrance of Things Past tries to um, uh, describe these very, very sort of fragmentary experiences, which are part of sort of being human and mm. kind of phenomenological in a sense. It's mm. all about sort of the relationship between the body and space and the world of the unconscious, you know. I mean, everyone knows, or most people sort of know the, the you know, the, the Madeleine cake, you know. Mm. Um, but there's, you know, the sort of eating him, dipping his, his sort of Madeleine cake in some tea and then eating it, and then this physical experience makes him remember, you know, suddenly his whole childhood opens up to him and he can remember the sensation of visiting his aunt um, in bed and her giving him Madeleine cake to dip in the tea. You know, and sort of the whole of Proust is, is kind of, you know, about that. It's always the kind of fragmentary, building up these sort of frag fragments mm. that describe human experience and mm. describe memory and sort of dreams. And the way that remembrance of things past starts, like with, you know, he talks about, um, you know, kind of at night sort of um, oh, the sensation of going mother. to sleep. Yeah. Or before... before the conversation yeah. about before the bit where he talks about his mother, but there's there's a sort of the thing of sitting in the chair, and the chair becoming a kind of um, almost like a sort of you know he's in his chair he's about to fall asleep and the chair becomes almost like a kind of time travel machine where he can sort of be transported to other places because he's in this gap between waking and sleeping, mm. and then he also talks about going to you know the door of his room being so familiar that he doesn't know if he's even opened the door of the room or not, and the whole description is focused on this action of whether you've turned the handle to your, you know, the door to your bedroom or not, you know, and it's very, in some way, very similar to, mm. you know, this, this very kind of minute sensation of looking down and up mm. you know, while reading a book. Mm. And kind of, and it's one of the things, I guess, with Proust is that, you know, there's often a kind of conversation about whether the book itself produces, I mean, Walter Benjamin talks about that um, quite a lot, sort of in, in his essay on, on Proust, where he talks about whether the book kind of actually produces you know, an experience in itself, you know. I mean, kind of the obvious thing with Bruce is because it's so incredibly long, by the time you get to the end, you know, you, you've sort of lived through a lot of time mm. and you have to remember back to the beginning. But also whether the, whether the book itself can produce an experience, you know, of a similar nature to what it's describing in, in the reader, mm. you know. And I guess this work is kind of throwing up those kind of questions. And I mean, Bruce obviously comes up you know, in another work, in yeah. The Captive, because, you know, the, the film that it's referencing is referencing one of the books of Remembrance of Things Past, like the Chantal Ackerman film, The Captive, mm. is a reference to um, Bruce, you know, Bruce the Captive, which is part mm. of Remembrance of Things Past. Mm -hmm. But um, to return to 
Thomas and Helke Beiler, though. Um, one, of the, one other thing I wanted to ask you about was titles, you know, because there's, um, it's very kind of, I mean, Bachelor Machines is a very particular kind of title. And again, it sort of points to, you know, a whole conversation about gender and sort of, you know, and Bachelor Machines as a title has so many associations. Um, could you tell us a bit about how you decided on that title? Mm. Um, yes, I was working, it was when I was in Oslo, because I was um, editing um, the film on the cargo ship, which is going to be screened, actually, it's not in the show, but it will be screened a couple of times, and uh, shooting part two with Thomas and Helga Byler. Um And um, I was looking at, I was, yeah, I was, went to a lecture that was involving um, Duchamp and then Zayman, Harold Zayman's exhibition of Bachelor Machines, but um, it became in my mind this very elastic term. It's been used in many different ways and one which sort of was both mechanical and sexual and male, obviously, um, but also spoke about something that was kind of um, where there was a missing part, you know, there's this sort of machine with a missing part feeling. Um, What's the missing part? I mean, because the most obvious reference is the Duchamp reference, you know, to the to the well, the fact that things by her batches, the, 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 the large sort glass. of yeah, the large glass. I mean, the, the the two parts of the glass don't actually connect, and um, that also that the whole thing doesn't quite doesn't actually make sense. It doesn't actually function, and it doesn't move. It doesn't like it's non-mechanical in the end. Um, Going back to the Duchamp, I mean, it's sort of, it's also some, as a term, it's sort of both um, male and therefore um, quite a virile term. You think of bachelors, but it's also, the, it's opposite, it's also masculating because it's sort of um, without the female. So there's this kind of un, you know, unvirile part of it as well. So it's just like, it seemed to be elastic enough that it could, that it could suggest both the presence and the, and the absence of a sort of sexual element and mechanical element. And um, in all, many films recently for me, the machinic thing has become dominant and the idea of, of a sort of machine, whether it be a sort of social institution, which has always been there in my work, or an actual machine or cinema as a sort of idea being a machine or, and, you know, I've never been interested in machines per se. I've never tinkered with machines or anything like that. So it's a bit of a surprise to me that this comes up. But it became a way of thinking about things like ships and closed communities or, or um, the way that we react to each other in groups. All of that became about machines. And I guess that is, I mean, it's, it's sort of, you know, kind of in a way that's, you know, that's what modernism is all about, is the relationship between man and machine and sort of the, me you know, kind of machine as metaphor for sort of social organisation, mm. as, you're, as you're describing. Mm. I mean, it seems very much, you know, that's, that's the sort of 20th century human condition, mm. you know, or kind of, you know, also 21st century human mm. condition. We see ourselves in relation to machines. And yeah. now that machine has become, you know, the computer, you know, now yeah. it's sort of more this space of, you know, kind of humans as cyborgs, humans in direct relations mm. with computers, blurring of the boundary between yeah. our bodies and the space of the computer. Mm. Whereas film is very much located in, you know, within the modern, you know, it's, it's a 20th century or late 19th century, you know, 20th century medium, you know, it's, it's very much that, you know, it is the, the kind of the machine in that sense rather than the sort of digital space of computers and mm. such. I mean, on a sort of side point that I'm sort of very interested in the idea of like the invention of a work of art and maybe that might be related to the idea of the invention of the machine, you know, this sort of, as Thomas is talking about on Bunch of Machines Part 2, where you go from the idea, which is an abstract thing, into something real, whether it be a work of art or whether it be Frankenstein's monster, or whether it be a machine, that you're sort of making some sort of contractual thing, you're, you're bringing something into the world and what's the payoff there? I mean, I'm quite interested in that in terms of how you, the, the making of a work of art, and I think somehow using the machine as a metaphor sort of taps into that invention of things as well, somehow. But and it's very constructed. I mean, the sort of um, I think the gap between you know kind of um, machines before the computer and sort of the world of you know the kind of digital world is that you know always feel with with anything pre-digital you 
you, you can kind of understand how it's put together, you know, or you can see it. It's not mm. a series of zeros and ones. It's like, okay, you see a big machine, you can see that this part, you know, mm. this piston goes into that bit and that mm. affects that part. And, you know, mm. you can see the sort of chain of reactions. Whereas with computers, you know, kind of, they're an absolute mystery to, you know, if you, the, mm. you know, the real sort of nitty gritty of how computers work are sort of a mystery unless you understand, mm. kind of, unless you can sort of read binary code or mm. something, you know, it kind of, the way it breaks down, it's not into, you know, it doesn't break down into a world of things, it breaks yeah. down into a world of numbers. I mean, I think I'm quite interested in things being translated, uh, as I say, from something um, intangible to something tangible. And that's why in The Prisoner, this thing of, like, the one film going through two projectors, for me, is, is an example of that, because you have two screens, you have the same film projected twice, so it goes into one projector, comes out, crosses about this much space this much, goes into another one, comes out and goes back. So what you see is like with this six or seven second delay, you see it and then you see it simultaneously but seven seconds late. So that experience for me is all about filmic time, which is an abstract concept being made visible by that much space of film. So it's sort of possible to work in that mode, to, to affect those transformations in that mode for me. So I with, use it. With that film, I wanted to ask kind of why, why Southbank? Why was it kind of, is that important? It was important to have stairs outside. And it was important to have, because um, I wanted her feet to be going upstairs and us to be following her. And it was important that it be, um, I suppose it's sort of, the, the, there's a strangeness or a sort of slightly brutal architecture. There is still the, the brutality of the architecture, which has um, got a kind of glamour to it that I wanted to have. I mean, I thought about doing it in, in somewhere really busy, like a station, like King's Cross or something, and then I realised that it would be very difficult to just to get that. And also, we wouldn't have these different depths of her going upstairs and down and across and sort of thing. So, yeah, it kind of worked for that reason. And what about the sound? Because, I mean, in a way, the sound in that film is also... Um, I remember you talking about sort of how in the Chantal Ackerman film, um, the scene that it references, um, the, the sound is of her high heel shoes clopping on the mm. ground is kind of out of, actually out of sync, yeah. isn't it? And so, again, that feels like that thing of the time, making the sort of time visible or sort yeah. of displacing time yeah. and playing with time. Because in your film, is the sound also out of sync? Like, is well, her it is from the second. Like well, there's two things. One is that when you see the film seven seconds late, you're seeing it with the sound of the first screen, so that becomes out of sync. But we deliberately exaggerated the sound of the high heel. So we, we did record her walking at the time, but then we took a Foley artist to the place and had her walk the same route in high heels and recorded that so that we could then get that unreal feeling of this post-production sound, which is what the Ackerman film had. Um, I saw this scene sort of um, when I went to the cinema in like 2001 I saw that film. There was this scene of the woman being followed. In, in, in that film you see the man following her. There was something very strange about the sound of her high heels which was wrong. It was a mistake, I think. But what it actually did was it made it more intense. So it meant that um, the sexual sort of tension and the sort of obsessiveness of the scene of a man following a woman was echoed in the sound of these high heels, which were just too loud and too close. So you heard that as if she was next to you, but you saw her far away. And it built up to this kind of adrenaline feeling of what when I was watching it. So I was very interested in the idea that a mistake in sound could heighten the meaning of the film, of that scene. So I tried to sort of reproduce that in, a, in the very crude way that I was showing the film, which is in the one way through separating it into two different times, and another way through exaggerating her heels, and then of course using this like super um, rich music that was very dramatic which was also used in the Ackerman film. And it's kind of, I mean, the music is Rachmaninoff, isn't it? Mm. It's, it's sort of... The Isle of the Dead. The Isle of the Dead. In, presumably that's a reference to the Brooklyn painting, The Isle yes. of the Dead, I'm assuming. Yeah. Which, again, is a kind of door to the space of the irrational, the world of dreams, you know, because Brooklyn mm. 
for anyone who doesn't know, is Belgian's 19th century Belgian symbolist painter. Um, and it's this very sort of dreamlike image. Um, so that seems, again, this sort of just, you know, kind of mm. small chink in the doorway, mm. kind of pointing in that direction. Mm. Um, but I wanted to ask you about the, um, also about the rehearsal piece, the phot photographic piece, because mm. that's quite a departure. And I know that that's one of the works that you're, because it's one of the newer works, and it's also, you know, a slightly different kind of, work for you that it's one of the works you're less sure about but it mm. also seems to me to be one of the works that sort of points to you know where you might be going in the future mm. um, so I wanted to I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about how that piece came about and what your interest in the rehearsal is. Um, well I'm interested in the rehearsals uh, the space of rehearsal and how that kind of illustrates this in between being and acting so that you know particularly if you imagine a sort of Shakespeare play being rehearsed so talking in this sort of particular language and then you come out of it and say but does he really mean that and what's that about and why is he you know and I don't know if I really want to do that you know something try to construct the character and at the same time being the character and also perhaps wearing like jeans and t-shirt but being you know King Henry or something so I'm interested in that and and I think it sort of works as a as a way of thinking through the other works in the exhibition because of that. But I was also interested in um, just these almost 100 images and then the sound and the gap between the two and how the viewer would close that gap and how it would then become an active space so that you would be looking at the pictures and listening to the sound and sort of imagining the voices projected onto the photographs. So I'm very interested in how the viewer projects and how we project onto things and how we kind of close, we finish works in a way and how that can be a satisfying experience or, or exciting or interesting. So how then the gap between um, the image and the sound could produce movement, which is what's not there. And what was the actual rehearsal? Like, what were they rehearsing? It was an opera, but it was an opera made up fragments um, by a young director. So it was his first project. So he was doing um, all these Mozart operas that he strung together to make a completely invented new opera. Oh, so it's fragments of different it's Mozart arias. Operas. It's all Mozart okay, arias. Okay. But they're brought together to invent a story with some bits of German text, read, but they're read like um, newspaper headlines that give you clues to the story, which is, it ends up being a story about incest. And was it, because I remember you went off to Berlin to film it, didn't you? So it was a production happening in Berlin. Yeah, I went there to, to shoot it and record it. Yeah, and were they comfortable with you being around? Were they yeah. sort of, so they, they sort of got used to you being around for well, photographing apparently, things? Apparently, according to, um, I can't remember who it was, somebody there told me that, um, at least one of the singers was sort of overperforming because of the presence of a sound recordist and a photographer. Because, you know, in rehearsal, I think the conductor was at a certain stage, kept saying, mark it, mark it, which means like, you know, take it down a notch or two, you know, because it's just a rehearsal, you don't want to ruin mm. your voice, kind of thing. So yes. maybe it was a bit of over sort of performing. That's interesting. Because it I mean, was going to be recorded, which is like, fair enough, because it becomes a performance mm. for them. But it's also interesting because it's, it's sort of the, in a way, it's the dilemma of the anthropologist, isn't it, or the social scientist, that you, that you can't ever objectively observe something. You always um, affect, affect the scenario mm. that you're observing by being present in the room. Mm. You know. um, but one other thing I wanted to ask you about, um, and then maybe we could open it up for questions, um, is, is the relationship between your collaborative practice with Lucy Scare and your practice as a solo artist, and how those two practices affect each other what the kind of overlap is. Mm. Because you've done a significant kind of body of films in, you know, directly in collaboration with Lucy Scare. Mm. Um, and is it a very different kind of process to when you're working on your own? Um, it's definitely different in that we sort of, dis we discuss every stage and we sort of, um, Lucy's in the audience tonight, so I'm very conscious. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> very conscious of speaking for both of us, but we, we sort of, I think we would agree that we sort of give each other permission to do things, which is good, I think. We work in a quite intuitive way, but we're talking all the time and sort of figuring things out as we go along. And we sort of, uh, I would say that our work is probably more um, 
in some ways more, more formal or, or slightly more abstract than than my work and um but yeah it totally bounces back and forth what i do is informed by what i do with lucy and i think it's the same for her um i mean certain themes i often see kind of certain themes that are in the work you do with lucy kind of appearing in yeah, your work as well yeah. i mean the sort of the, you know a work like um uh, Flash in the Metropolitan, which was filmed in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, that's one of the collaborative works. You know, it's sort of um, these kind of, it's, you know, in one sense, it's a very kind of fragmentary film. You know, there's sort of, you know, spaces of black was, and then suddenly a kind of a flash of light and you see a sort of object illuminated, you know, kind of, and you've talked about those objects as being quite archetypal. Again, you know, they're sort of quite dumb objects, you know, and they seem to have a direct relationship to um, the faces in eyeballing, for example, mm. you know, the very sort mm. of, you know, kind of the, the fragmentary nature of it, the way that the film is sort of built up through these mm. kind of fragmentary images. Well, I think um, it relates to both our practice in that we both, um, quite interested in the idea of setting up a certain language, certain visual language that then we present in the film and then it, it is continued throughout the film, so you sort of learn it as you watch. And I think that, that fits in with both our practices and also... Um, and also, oh yeah, <laughs> that relates to um, what I was talking about earlier about seeing through a filter or through a screen. I think that's something that Lucy and I are both quite interested in our work, although it's quite different, my work and her work. What we share is this idea that we're quite, both quite into looking at things through screens, would you say? Like a screen could be looking at it in a certain way, which might be a certainly, a sort of obsessively squint way, or it might be um, a particular you know, she might be using particular patterns or, you know, this, that build mm. up a picture. Or, you know, this kind of yeah. finding a method, continuing with it and learning that with the audience as a sort of language or with the viewer as a sort of language. Yeah. And this, I think there's a big relationship in kind of um, both your work and in the collaborative work between, you know, still images and moving images. Like, you often film still images, like, the, you know, filming the painting in Jack Straw's castle or filming the faces in, um, in eyeballing, you know, or the work you've done with Lucy, you know, for example, I mean, Flash in the Metropolitan, which I referred to before, you know, they're almost like still images, the sort of, when you have the flash and you see the object illum illuminated, it's almost a still image. Mm. And this, you know, this seems to kind of come up a lot, this sort of, kind of, you know, filming still images or still images becoming <coughs> sort of moving images and sort of, mm. you know, the stillness is often kind of, you know, in direct contrast with these other scenes where you have a lot of activity and a lot of well, It's action probably this binary thing that you were talking about before. I mean, it's like using reality to talk about beyond reality. It's using still images in a way to talk about movement. It's sort of using the opposite to get to where you're at, yeah. I think. But should we, should we open up for questions? Mm.